I'm going to begin, um, I want to say thank you all for coming. And my dear friend Janet has come from Princeton meeting. Um, and I, are there people from other meetings? I, I feel like there were. Yeah. Westfield. Westfield and Mount Holly. I'm so thrilled. That just that touches my heart and gives me like a boost <laughs> to do this. Um, so I want to begin by saying that we are going to look at George Fox's book of miracles today. It's in print, and there's a long story about that. Well, I'm going to condense it, but it, it's a it's a miracle that it's in print um, because this book, which Fox kept, disappeared. And it's a very, very mysterious story, but maybe based on some of the things I share with you, we can begin to discern why it disappeared. And um, it has been a major reconstruction project to put it in print again. So I think this is such a, an important text for us, and part of my life work is to bring this back to life and spirit among Society of Friends. So I'm really excited to be here talking about it today. Um, let me begin with 1923, which is when Henry Cadbury, famous Quaker scholar and historian, um, discovered at the Friends House Library in London all the manuscripts of George Fox, and in those manuscripts he discovered the, a comprehensive catalog of all the papers and books written by George Fox. In that catalog, it said, a book of miracles. But he searched and looked and looked and searched, and he couldn't find a book of miracles. He found everything else that was accounted for, everything else, but not the book of miracles. It is certain that the book of miracles existed, it is certain that Fox requested its publication. It is actually in George Fox's will that this book be published along with other books that he named. Um, and he even left money to pay for its publication upon his death. And it disappeared. I just find that stunning. So Henry Cadbury decided to reconstruct it. How did he do that? He looked at the index, and on the index were listed 176 miracles that George Fox had um, enacted, or I don't know what my verb is there, had, had performed. But that was only skimming the surface. He went in the journal, and the journal had been largely edited by uh, Thomas Elwood, the editor of Fox's journal. He went to the manuscript folios, and I have seen these folios, so I can speak firsthand to this. If you go to the Friends House Library in London and you request any of these folios, they're written in that old 17th century handwriting, you know, where the S's look like F's, and it takes hours to just begin to learn how to read this. It's almost like another language. But once you do, you get the hang of it. And it's all the manuscripts that Fox kept um, of his writings, his letters, his epistles, his miracles, etc., cetera. Um, and in these folios, you see big black ink strokes going through all different pages. Some pages are cut out just in part, like the top part of the page. Jagged lines where there have been ripped pages. And you can't believe it. You say, well, what's gone? Where is it? And it's gone. They're gone. And so it begins to, it's almost like cracking a code or a mystery. Uh, a detective sort of thing. Why is, it, why is all of this happening? Well, what Henry Cadbury did is he reconstructed as best he could. He looked at all the materials and he found ev any trace, any mention of a miracle, he put together. And he essentially, just by compiling them, came together with a book of miracles. It's clearly not the book that Fox left, which had much more narrative and detail, but at least it's an accounting of those miracles. Um, Cambridge University Press published it in 1948. They republished it in 1973, and then it just went out of print until the year 2000 when Quakers United in public, 
Patience Quip published it. And this is what I'm holding today. This is the Quip edition 2000. Um, it has wonderful introductions by Henry Cadbury, um, Paul Anderson, who's a Quaker theologian, and finally, Jim Pym, who is a British friend and who's responsible for this. I met Jim Pym in 1999 when I was on a spiritual pilgrimage in England. And I said to him, I really believe that the Book of Miracles needs to come into print. I believe that the time is now, that friends are ready. And he said, Michelle, you're not going to believe this. It's actually already in the works. It's coming out next year. So we both agreed in that moment that the time is ripe and that it's not just an isolated person here or there, but that many friends are starting to reach back to this as a seed of hope for, for our religious society. Um, we generally think of George Fox, I said this earlier, as the prophet, um, the man traveling through the countryside preaching, um, going into churches, calling truth to power, in prison, um, doing all kinds of things, writing prolifically. But we don't really think of him as a healer, as a person who would travel around almost in the footsteps of Jesus and do healing so that when he came into a town or village, people already knew he was coming. He had a reputation as a healer. And they, he would perform hands-on healing. Um, they say that he had a peculiar power in his eyes. That if he looked at you, you felt the healing. I just felt it with Jake. Um, or, um, they would say, just one look, one look from George Fox, and your life changed. Because he could go, he could see right into your soul. Now, he would say, anyone has the power to do that. That's not a superiority thing for, for George Fox. That is living close to God. And that's where he <coughs> resided. And many, many people said this about him among the early friends, even into the next generation of friends. Um, William Penn said, Fox knew and lived nearer to the Lord than other men. And um, just a further testament to that. He was extremely charismatic. Uh, even his hands, people said he had healer's hands. Um, and so if he, he would come in and pray with you, he would kneel down beside you. And then he would put his hands, laying on of hands, and he, he healed hundreds and hundreds, I dare say probably even thousands of people in his lifetime because he never stopped in his many decades as a healer. And um, he had telepathy. He considered becoming a doctor. Um, he said that he didn't feel physicians truly understood what they were doing. Um, and we'll talk about that a little more later. But he didn't, he felt that being um, a minister of the Lord was being a physician. And a lot more than that. He also was an herbalist. I think of Judy a lot with the plants. Um, he, he knew that the plants held the secrets. And so it's so interesting to me. I learned this. He actually bequeathed a big, a large plot of land to Philadelphia residents because he wanted a school set up and he wanted them to learn the secrets and the healing curative properties of plants. So he really was a firm believer in, in the earth, in the, the divine creation, and in connecting with that and with God. Um, they say that Fox could look with love and detachment on an injured person and that healing power would surge through his body in response to the person's ailment, to whatever was wrong. He did not take this as something he did on his own. He completely attributed it to the power of God. And he did not say, it's just me doing it. He said to all the people in his religious family, go do it too. Just like the apostles, go and heal. 
You all have the power to do it if you live closely with God. And so it was extremely democratic, and I dare say it was extremely threatening to mainstream society to have a very large and growing number of people believing that they held the power for healing and that it wasn't something they had to go to pay a priest to do or pay a doctor to do, but that they themselves could do it. Now, the time that Fox lived was absolutely right for someone like him to come along. Um, miracles, just to give you more of a historical context, miracles were accepted as a part of life. It wasn't really looking through our 21st century lens today. We really have to step back and, and wonder what the people were doing in the time. Um, miracles have been accepted in religious history for thousands of years. I mean, pre-Christian, pre-Judeo-Christian, um, ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, India, China, Japan. I mean, miracles abound, and the stories of these miracles abound. But at the time that Fox lived, people truly believed, they were waiting for someone to come with apostolic power, to come. And the way that that person, people believed, would show that power is through miracles. You know, there needed to be some kind of tangible, physical evidence to mainstream society. And they wanted someone to come who could perform, who could show that healing surged through his body. And I say his intentionally, because I don't believe that most people would allow in their minds for a woman to be doing that. And that's another reason Fox became so radical, because when he said everybody can do it, he meant everybody. And that means women, too. And not just women, but children. And children were performing miracles. So it's a really exciting, radical movement in the making because of all those reasons. Um, now, early Quaker theology, just very, very briefly, um, I wanted to walk through this with you to explain why this was so radical. Most religions said that um, spirituality or connection to God has nothing to do with the body. The body was considered mortal, weak flesh. The spirit was connected to God. And in, a, in sort of a dualistic way, people believed that men were aligned with spirit and women were aligned with the body because women give birth. And so this is a long philosophical tradition. Um, people believed that in terms of enthusiasm, Quakers believe that when spirit poured onto flesh, which is what Fox talked about all the time, spirit will pour onto flesh when you're open to God and living close to God. When that happens, you are filled with the spirit of Christ. Every cell in your body will radiate that inward light. And when that happens, It's magic. I mean, that, that's when everything is possible in the universe. Everything. You are the living Christ. Now, others who heard that said, that's blasphemy. But to Fox and to the early friends, that was the moment of apocalypse. Apocalypse wasn't waiting for somebody to come from the sky and start the day of judgment. Apocalypse was right here, right now, over and over again, when spirit poured onto flesh. And people, Fox proclaimed, perfection was proclaimed. It was pre-fall. It was before the fall from Eden. It was pre-lapsarian. It was magnificent and holy and oneness with God. Um, he cited the Bible. Some people say he knew the Bible better. If the Bible had been destroyed, they would just ask Fox and he could start um, reciting it for, <laughs> for record, recording. Um, but the, the Bible verse he often cited was Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Even upon the men servants and maid servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And so, in that moment, 
when spirit is poured onto flesh and one becomes the living Christ, one is enthused, one is filled with the spirit of God. That is the moment, moment when any healing can happen, when anything can happen, when, um, when, when perfection is proclaimed and the apocalypse is alive. And so, okay. People in this time expected miracles to happen. They didn't just say, oh, a miracle happened. It was expected every moment. It wasn't something that was daunting and exciting and then it passed. It was on and on and on. So this book, in a sense, was not something strange. This book was just another affirmation. And so much was happening, so many miracles, he thought, I better keep a record. And he did. They believed that Christ was present, working, day to, in the moment, just like it was in the New Testament. Um, it was the same gift that the apostles were experiencing. The lame were walking, the blind were seeing, the deaf were hearing. Um, and the power of God was manifesting through the people. Okay? So... In this book of miracles, of the 176 miracles that are reconstructed by Henry Cadbury, these are the kinds of things you see. Um, people often, Fox writes, are they're sick or not well. He just, these are quotations. Um, what he does, he's moved to go to them or they call him to come. He lays his hands on them, he kneels beside them, and then they are cured. Um, there are instances of fever, flux, measles, lameness, blindness, ulcers, the king's evil, which was scrofula, um, toothaches. One man actually had a broken neck from falling off of a horse, and Fox healed him. Kidney stones, palsy, and then there were some mental illnesses, depression despondency, insanity, moping. One woman moped for two months. That was the verb attributed to her. Um, fits, stargazing, that's my favorite. <laughs> but she was cured. Um, convulsions, um, and ague. So again, all kinds of sicknesses of the times. In these, women are cured much more than men. There are records of women. And I find that interesting, but we can talk about that if you like. Um, and there are children who are cured. At least two persons cured were very famous. Very, very famous. So Fox did have a reputation as a healer. One was Oliver Cromwell's favorite daughter. And um, it's when she was older, but her name, she was known as Lady Claypole. She was severely depressed. And how did he cure her, interestingly enough? By a letter. He didn't even go see her. And this goes with all the work that I, I've been doing on um, how Fox per perceived writing as an extended form of prophecy. That he wrote it from the Spirit, and that letter carried the spirit outwardly. When she received that letter, her depression was over. And she, re she reported that. So people thought, oh my word, it's not just even the body anymore. Or the words through prophecy. It's actually the prophetic word on the, print, on the page. And that's all the more reason that the Book of Miracles and anything Fox ever wrote should have been published. To do the work, to touch those who read it. Um, it's interesting that out of all of this, out of the numerous healings that were happening, the miracles that were taking place, this is the same time that women became very, Quaker women became very um, active in London, and Fox set up two meetings just for the women. One was called a box meeting, and one was called a two weeks meeting. In these meetings, 
which by the way, a woman, Sarah Blackborough, went to Fox and said, we really need to do something here. There were so many miracles and healings happening in London that the women were um, performing, that they actually wanted a place where people could go. The box meeting was called that because they had a little box where people could put in donations to help, and the money in that box they would give to the needy, or the poor, or the homeless, and so forth. But then in the meetings themselves, they would do the hands-on healings. And Fox wrote in his journal and in letters that thousands of miracles were happen happening there. He wrote the word thousands. So I, I just love thinking about that, that this work, as I said, wasn't just Fox's. His was the, he was the beginning of it, but it just spread outwardly. Um, there was a lot of backlash in response to this, you know, movement of miracles. And the anti-Quakers would go anytime they could find the performance of miracles, and they would write anti-Quaker tracts and pamphlets and just make fun of these Quakers and the crazy things they did. They quake, they're possessed by the devil. See, they didn't think that Quakers were possessed by God. They thought that they were possessed by the devil. Why? Because they quake. And if you're in your body and you're physical, then you're of the devil. So it was already a lose-lose situation for Quakers in that context. Whereas most, as I said earlier, Judeo-Christian religions separated the body from the spirit. Fox connected the body and the spirit. But for that very reason, Quakers were called all kinds of things. Witches, devils, the devil's imps. Um, possessed, you know, animals and so forth. I mean, they went, they went all out with this. Um, as there were more and more attacks on friends, I mean, and I mean literal attacks, people would come into their meetings and physically harm them, mutilate them, then throw them in prison. Um, they were just so threatening to mainstream society. The propaganda really fueled a movement, a wave against Quakers. And by the end of the 17th century, so, you know, 45 years into the movement, Quakers were, I mean, so many had died in prison or died by attack, and the movement itself became much more careful about uh, prophecy, miracles, and so forth, and they started censoring themselves from within. And this reign of censorship spread everywhere. It spread to the writings, to the publications, it spread into the meetings for worship where friends no longer wanted to be enthused and filled with the Spirit of God. They wanted to be more quietistic. They wanted to be quiet, still. If they felt moved to prophesy, they had to ask themselves again and again and again, three times, am I really moved by God to speak? Or, you know, am I really supposed to do this? And so everybody started censoring themselves. The movement censored itself. The publications were censored. There was a censoring committee called the Second Day Morning Meeting that literally said to hundreds of people who wanted to publish things, no, that is not me to print. We don't do that anymore. There was a massive wave of censorship. And that is when the black ink stroke started and the cutout pages. We cannot have this enthusiasm. It makes us look bad. We have to dignify and save the movement. We can't be running around and doing these crazy things and being called crazy by all these other people. And so um, there's a scholar, Richard Bailey, who's done major reconstructive work. And he says that the manuscripts in the Friends House Library are actually bowdlerized. He uses a very strong verb. Um, destroyed, just destroyed. Because, um, and sometimes you can read through the black gang stroke, but it's hard. Uh, but the pages that are cut out will never know. A lot of the earliest friends called Fox names, um, even they called him Son of God, they called him Holy Father, Nursing Father, terms that were quite godly. And this embarrassed this censoring wave of friends as well. Um, but they didn't remove everything because we've been able to recover little bits of it. Um, 
Anyway, when Fox died in 1691, he left all of his writings to 13 men friends, executors of his estate. And he said, okay, I want this published. I want my journal published. I want my book of miracles published. And I want my epistles and letters and travels published. The journal came out, the letters and epistles came out, and the Book of Miracles disappeared. But if you put it in that context of this wave of censorship, it makes perfect sense. Um, but where is it? I want that Book of Miracles. I want to find it. I really want to find it. I'm not done. But I don't think I don't know if I'm going to find it. Um, what is interesting to me is that when I met Jim Pym in 1999, and he said this book was about to come out, he said, we're at a crossroads because friends are ready to hear it again. It took a few hundred years. But the healing of those wounds is beginning to happen, and the fear is starting to melt. And now we are in 2012, and I'm still waiting. I'm not sure that many friends really know about the Book of Miracles. Because I know when I shared it with some of my friends from this meeting, they said, what? What, book? what are you talking about? And I thought, oh my word, well, I'm clearly not doing my job, my part. I should be sharing the, the, sharing the gold. I mean, this is the message. Um, what I see among the Society of Friends is a willingness and openness to go back to our spiritual roots because we're tired. And perhaps we're tired, we're tired because we're living in a rat race of the world, but perhaps we're also spiritually tired because we've lost the sense of magic and wonderment and spiritual excitement. And the seeds are all there, they've just been buried. They've been buried for hundreds of years and they were intentionally buried. But can we look at them again? Can we revive that spirit that literally moved mountains in the dead? Um, are we ready for that? That magic and promise and hope and the mystery and the wonder. So I think this is one of the ways in. And I'm sad to say our library doesn't have it, but I'm happy to say we're going to get it. <laughs> and you can order it on Amazon.com which is what I did. Um, so, that's enough of my introduction. Um, we could do questions, uh, or we could read a few excerpts from it, if you would like to do that. I thought maybe we should. Yeah. Yeah, okay, Ooh, I love that. All right. And um, I have here, this is Richard Bailey's book, which I highly recommend New Light on George Fox and Early Quakerism, The Making and Unmaking of a God, because he was an avatar. And that's what the censoring friends in the second generation of Quakerism, they were afraid of that. Um, but it's a very fascinating piece. And this is a sweet little pamphlet I found when I was over at the Friends House Library called George Fox and the Healing Ministry by David Hodges. And I love it. It has a lot to do with everything I said. I don't even know if it's out of print anymore. But when I was reading the Book of Miracles, um, Jim Pym talks about it in here. So it's, these are all starting to connect the dots. So I recommend this as well. OK, I'm going to read four excerpts. And then we'll talk. The first is, I'm just going to read it exactly as it is, and I'm warning you, they're brief because they're reconstructed, you know, there's no adding or embellishing here. It's just the raw, basic, anything Henry Cadbury could find. Can you tell us the Yeah, page 101. Oh, one. do you have a copy, my darling? You are hot. Okay. <laughs> and there was a woman at NMSC which had been many years in trouble. 
and would sometimes sit moping, oh this is my moper, sit moping <laughs> near two months together and hardly speak nor mind anything. And you know that's a problem if a woman won't do her work. <laughs> so I was moved to go to her and tell her that salvation was come to her house and did speak other words to her and for her. And that hour she mended and passed up and down with us to meetings and is well, blessed be the Lord. And that was in Maryland, third of first month, 1673. So the moping woman was healed. Okay. Um, this is after he had an encounter with priests Hired, he called them hirelings, which is just so <laughs> brutal. <laughs> um, but, you know, Fox, truth to power. So he had an, an, an interaction with them. While I was there, the Lord opened to me three things relating to those three great professions in the world. Physic, divinity, so-called, and law. So I was thinking, is our world any different today? Lawyers, doctors, and ministers. And he showed me that the physicians and doctors of physic were out of the wisdom of God, by which the creatures were made, and so knew not the virtues of the creatures, because they were out of the word of wisdom by which they were made. And he, God, showed me that the priests were out of the true faith, which Christ is the author of, the faith which purifies and gives victory and brings people to have access to God by which they please God, which mystery of faith is held in a pure conscience. God showed me also that the lawyers were out of the equity and out of the true justice. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> oh, and, all right. And out, of, I love it. and out of the law of God, which went over the first transgression and over all sin, and answered the spirit of God that was grieved and transgressed in man. And that these three, the physicians, the priests, and the lawyers, ruled the world out of the wisdom, out of the faith, and out of the equity and law of God. The one pretending to the cure of the body, the other the cure of the soul, and the third the property of the people. But I saw they were all out, out of the wisdom, out of the faith, out of the equity and perfect law of God. <clears throat> no miracles in that, but I had to read it to you. Okay, here's another miracle. And this is on page one. One oh six. And coming to Mansfield Woodhouse, there was a distracted woman under a doctor's hand, with her hair loose all about her ears. And he was about to let her blood, she being first bound, and many people being about her, holding her by violence. But he could get no blood from her. You know, bloodletting. And I desired them to unbind her and let her alone, for they could not touch the spirit in her by which she was tormented. So they did unbind her, and I was moved to speak to her, and in the name of the Lord to bid her be quiet and still, and she was so. And the Lord's power settled her mind, and she mended, and afterwards received the truth and continued in it to her death. And the Lord's name was honored, to whom the glory of all his works belongs. 1649. Mm. And the last one I was going to read today. Page 110. And there was a boy lying in the cradle, which they rocked, about 11 years old. And he was grown almost double and I cast my eye upon the boy, and seeing he was dirty, I bid the lass wash his face and his hands and get him up and bring him unto me. 
So she brought him to me, and I bid her take him and wash him again, for she had not washed him clean. Then I was moved of the Lord God to lay my hands upon him and speak to him, and so bid the last take him again and put on his clothes, and after we passed away. And sometime after, I called at the house, and I met his mother, but did not light. Oh, stay, says she, and have a meeting at our house, for all the country is convinced by the great miracle that was done by thee upon my son. For we had carried him to wells and the bath, and all the doctors had given him over. For his grandfather and father feared he would have died, and their name have gone out, having but that son. But presently after you was gone, says she, we came home and found our son playing in the streets. Therefore, said she, I just got goosebumps, all the country found our son playing, uh, all the, therefore, said she, all the country would come to hear if I would come back and have a meeting there. And this was about three years after that she told me of it. And he was grown to be a straight, full youth then, and so the Lord have the praise. <coughs> so, many more, but um, shall we talk or you talk to me? What, any questions, thoughts, reflections? Yes. Um, what age was he when he started preaching and, and were miracles concurrent with the preaching right away? Oh, I love your you? question. I don't know. Um, I think he was in his early 20s when he started the preaching, but the miracles recorded again, I'm looking to see if I can find a year. Did you date like 1849? Yeah, that was 1849. Right. Okay. Um, he was born in, was it 24? 1624? I'm, I'm reaching for my papers. Anybody know off the top? I just read it. I, I feel like it's 1624. So in his 20s, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think he kept a record of the miracles initially. I think he, I think he had to see the phenomena as it was happening, and then he reached back. And he probably remembered some of the times. Do you know what I mean? Um, but clearly he didn't record everything. And I think initially not. But, yeah, more. So, not very much time had passed between when he started and that censorship began, only what, 30, 40 years, or how much? Actually, um, the censorship started in 1656 because that's the year of the Naylor incident, James Naylor. Naylor was another leader of the Quaker movement, and I would love to talk more about him at some point for the, you know, with the meeting. But he, um, Naylor was as, as charismatic, if not more, than George Fox. And um, he was enacting the same miracles. In fact, they say Naylor raised someone from the dead, Dorcas Erbury, who had been dead for two days. Um, Never yeah, know you're looking scared. So, um, and so many people turned to James Naylor as a le the leader. There was a real thing going on between him and Fox, and it's a fascinating story. But Naylor ultimately took the mes message of, you know, being the living Christ, being filled with the Spirit. And on Palm Sunday one year in 1656, he rode into Bristol on the back of a donkey as if you were riding into Jerusalem. And there were women singing Hosanna and putting the palms down. And the people of Bristol went ballistic, saying this, it couldn't be more blasphemous. And he was even saying, well, his initials were J.N., Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> so they branded him with a B, with a hot iron, and they punished him severely, physically, and he almost didn't live. Um, and after that, that's when censorship began, the seeds of it, because Fox said, we cannot have this. It's out of control. So between 1656 and 1672, the reigns of censorship 
moved in that 16 years. And by 1672, it was completely set. And the second day morning meeting was set up to really squelch enthusiasm in print and in prophecy in the meetings. So However, he, he, in, in he knew it was all going on, but I think he was conflicted. I really believe in my heart. He knew that the, the, the magic, the spirit was there, and he didn't want to lose that fervor and that power, but he saw that not everybody was doing it his way, so to speak, or the, the way, and it was getting mired and tainted, and the attacks were getting you know, increasing. And so at a certain point, he said, okay, we have to rein it in. But he kept performing miracles. Until he was dead, he kept performing miracles and reporting them. So I think that's why he wanted this to live on. But they didn't let it. Yeah. My true belief is that those elders said, get rid of it. still being rocked in a cradle at age 11 and three years later Fox goes back and the mother says he's he's fully healed and we don't know the rest of his life but it seems like it, you're right to follow up with that like everything's still okay and I know I'm thinking so much about healing right now because um, I know in my own family I mean, and everyone everyone in this meeting everyone in our world has come up against our healthcare system. Um, and it's just brutal. You know, you have to go to a different doctor for every part of your body. <laughs> and what kind of follow-up is there if you don't advocate for yourself in a, in a hospital setting, in nurse, with nurses and doctors, and then with insurance? And it's just a quagmire. I mean, you get lost in the sauce, so to speak. It's just, it's incredible. And, just to think, is healing, is holistic, spiritual, physical healing accessible to us? Um, I talk about this in my witch in literature class because we have to talk about witches and witchcraft and healing and magic. And I, I often tell them about different countries and cultures where healing is just completely differently perceived. So in Bulgaria, there's a little woman named Vanya, and she lives in a little shack next to a chicken coop. And people walk 20 to 30 miles to get to Vanya for healing, hands on healing. And they report that they're healed, and they never went to a doctor. You know, even, even blindness, or you know, ulcers, or cancers, or you name it. And I think, oh my word, that sounds far more appealing to me than <laughs> calling up New Jersey Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. I mean, it's just awful. Um, or I have an Aunt Joan, and she's got terminal cancer. And she, a few weeks ago, she told the doctor, I know who my doctor is. Just like this, she pointed. And he looked at her and he said, I'm sure you do. Like he was, he was humbled by that. You know, because there's something to that. If you believe that, your, your body just might tweak to it. Do you, you know, there's something very mystical about healing that I, don't, I agree with Fox. I don't know that physicians have all the answers. Yes? I, I wanted to ask you, because I, I very, remember very clearly sitting in this meeting years and years ago, and there was a woman, I don't know what we were having, you know, the first day school or whatever, and there was a woman on the facing bench talking, older woman with very long hair, I think it was great, and she talked about the, how she 
healed. And she explained how, how the spirit came through her. And she, she talked about how it felt and what she did. And I guess what I was asking is, have you met any Quakers who now who are healers? The closest I've come is at Pendle Hill. The year I lived there, I was very blessed to be the Cadbury Scholar and work on all this material and share it with the community. And they said, we want to have a meeting for Worship for Healing. We, we want to have, what does that mean? No, I'm just trying to Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you were sending me a note. <laughs> um, oh, move. Oh, it's very hard. Oh, I need it. It's very hard. Ooh, like an aura. So, um, a meeting for worship for healing, which is the earliest practice. It's what Fox was doing, essentially, in a spirit, in that spirit of prayer and connection to God, hands-on healing, or just sitting beside the person, some kind of touch or intimate, you know, not in like contact, um, and praying for healing. And so we started doing it at Pendle Hill, sort of experimentally. It was phenomenal. Now, I wouldn't say that any one person walked out of there and said, I'm a healer. It wasn't that, but I saw healing happen. So it was more group centered, which I think Fox would say, rock on, that's, that's what it should be. You know, there's no hierarchy here, there's no pedestal, but that it's open to all of us. And I have seen it. I really have seen it. I mean, I've, there were many, Actually, there were many women there that year who were very, very depressed. And I, I, my heart ached for them. It was a very difficult year for them. And they healed a lot. And I think I attribute a lot to those meetings for healings. But maybe it was the love and connection they felt too. You know, but it all goes together, I guess. Just yeah. to talk to Lucy, I know Lucy came to our workshop yeah. for worship and ministry. And actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know if you know, now it's going to happen on a more regular basis every other month. But the first Monday, anybody here knows? Third. Third, third it's Monday. It's going to be October 15th. Monday, October 15th. We're going to have our first one. Yeah, and we're going to try it. We're going to try for on a regular basis, and it was based on that workshop. Where? It'll be yes. here. Oh. At 7 o'clock on um, Monday, October 15th. It's going to be the first one. And then it's going to be every other month. We were going to, there was so much interest from the workshop, and so many people felt the difference on those 45 minutes of the exercise, or half an hour of the exercise, that um, they started at this point. Yeah. Yes. Um, I grew up with two, both my grandmother, uh, my great grandmother on my mother's side, and my grandmother on my father's side with yours. My grandmother on my father's side, um, she would take her children to the doctor to find out what was wrong with them. And then she would send my grandfather out into the woods to get certain herbs. Uh, and she would make uh, broths and sags and what have you. I didn't find out about my um, great-grandmother and two, I was, uh, she's from, um, she was from uh, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and I wanted to go visit her grave, my, her and my grandmother's grave, but it, back then, uh, then they couldn't be buried in the white cemeteries. So they had cemeteries for black folks, and they were usually out in the woods, and <clears throat> the town had grown up, so I couldn't get my bearings of where it was. I had been there several times. And um, I remember we were driving around for some time, and uh, the person I was with said there was a, 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 an older white woman coming out of, she just appeared coming out of a cornfield. And we stopped her and asked, I said, because the young person wouldn't know. So I asked her if she knew the Todds that lived in the area. And she said, oh, yeah, Betty Todd, you know, used to cook for my mama. And, you know, and I said, well, where's the, the cemetery? So she told me where it was. And, she, and I told her who I was, and she said, I knew your great-grandmother. Hmm. And she said, uh, she lived way back in the woods, and people would go to her when they were sick. Hmm. 
And she said, as a child, we were, we would, when we saw her, she very seldom came out of the woods, but when she did, um, we would hide. Not that we thought she was gonna hurt us, but we knew she was special. Mm -hmm. And she said that there were times when my mother, if someone of us was sick, she said she would go to her. And she said, I remember her taking my brother once, and she didn't say anything, she just laid hands on him. So when I first heard about, I, I was working at Pentagon at the time, the, the Book of Miracles, I was very, very intrigued because I had been around healers all my life. And in the Pentecostal churches, many of the black Pentecostal churches, healings take place. Uh, the church that um, Martin Luther King spoke at just before he died, Mason Temple in Memphis. If, I don't know where they still have it, but before I came to Quakers, I belonged to the Church of God in Christ, which that was. And you could, they had um, crutches and what have you all around the wall, walls where people would come from all over the country to Mason Temple for uh, Bishop Mason to lay hands on them. And they would be healed. And I, I just wondered why um, in the white churches, I don't know whether it's because of our ancestry in Africa, because you can still go to, I go to Ghana, you can still go to Ghana and find healers. Um, why is it that there's such a contrast? Because I think in any black family or community, and you mention it, <laughs> and you get someone to talk about it, there's someone in our background mm -hmm. that we're healers. Mm -hmm. Well, I could go on and I love everything you said. <laughs> And um, I, I oh, and I love the stories of your your elders, mm -hmm. your your grandmother my and your your great -grand my great grandmother on my mother's right. side and my grandmother on my father's um, side. Back to my witches, the healers. They were the earliest healers mm -hmm. in more European strain, um, and the fear that has been just implanted in society across time against that sort of more local home remedy, that knowledge of healing. It's, it's just so intense that people ha have grown to fear it so much, they'll go to the institutionalized religion more so. Um, and there's, there's a big, there's just a huge gap there now, where you're like, where are the healers? You know, and if they are there, they're hiding because of that fear. So I, I, we could go on and on about that, but, um, I think that it's an important question. And, you know, where are they in Quakerism? Mm -hmm. Right? But they're here. It's all here. We just can't be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. You have to embrace it. Embrace the light of it, the goodness. Yes? There is an outgrowth of Quakerism in spiritualism. And some yes. of those groups have healings at their regular services. Yes, that's many Quakers back in the 19th century crossed over to spiritualism. That's right, I just read about that. And so are they still practicing today? There's a local church in Westland. I didn't know. Fantastic. Have you attended? Yes, I okay. attended recently. Fantastic. But they um, have healing as part of the service. Just that um, at Friends General Conference, that's just a regular part, is this one room set aside for healing, and it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the same thing, meeting for worship for healing. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Judy? Michelle, um, in Eastern medical practice, or Eastern healing practice, I'll say, this fear that we experience or the distrust that we experience in the East doesn't exist. It does not exist in the East, Eastern practice. And, uh, I recently uh, saw an excerpt from uh, a lecture given by a name that wouldn't reverberate here. Anyway, there was a piece in it of a healing in a hospital in Beijing. Healing of a three-inch tumor mm -hmm. in three minutes by two healers who didn't even touch the patient. Mm -hmm. And on film, you watch the tumor. 
I don't doubt it for a second. And I, I don't. It's so sad that um, it's looked upon with such suspicion. And skepticism and fe it's fear. It's just so driven by fear. I know. Because yes, I mean, many healers that I've studied or who at some I've met, they'll say, initially you may need to feel like you have to be there, like a hands-on healing. But at a certain point in time, you don't even have to be there. You know, you could, you could just, uh, there's one woman that I've worked with in the past from Colorado by phone. You can call her and just say, I really, you know, I have this, this, and this, and she'll, from, it's telepathic, you know, and I think that's how we were created and wired from way back when, but we've, we've grown so out of touch with it that now we feel like we can't. But many cultures still do that, like the Aborigines in Australia. I know that's how they communicate and live. They don't have texting and cell phones and computers, and they know how to find each other, where to go, when, what they need. I, I wanted to know about um, if there is some sort of residual, something left over, because when we hold people in the light, you know, people who are in the hospital, I'm from Princeton meeting, and we hold people in the light who are in the hospital or somebody who's undergone, you know, some horrible trauma. And I'm wondering if that isn't some kind of way of trying to get people through prayer to heal. They don't say, can I have the address of your doctor or the no. name of your doctor, but let's hold so-and-so and they name them. I think, Janet, life. that's what we're doing. I think that's exactly what we're doing. We just haven't really connected those dots. Mm -hmm. But that's it, you know? I mean, even when my mother was sick and I asked everyone to pray for her, she started getting better. Now, there could be a hundred reasons that doctors will give for that, but I know. I don't doubt. So it's holding in the light. It's powerful. And it could be for anything. We have that power, and together it just grows. You know, well, it's just like when uh, the, uh, the, the uh, soldier or the gentleman came to Jesus and said, my daughter is sick, and he said, he said, you don't just speak the word. You don't even have to go. You have the power to speak the word, and I know that she will be healed just by you speaking the word. So that goes back to what our sister is saying, that when we, when we have that intention of healing someone, we can just speak the word and that person can be healed. If we have the faith to believe. It's the faith of believing it. That's it. That's the key. Fox would say, you have to believe it. It's, it's, you know, it's here, here, and then it's here. So. More? I think we should wrap it up. It's 12.15. I have loved being with you. And um, I hope you'll come to the meeting for Worship for Healing on October 15th. Everyone is welcome. And it's at 7 p.m. in this room. I think it's in this room. If it's not, we'll tell you where it is. Rocky. My friend's son has cancer very bad. I wonder if we could just take a few moments to hold up. His name is Casey Ravel. To hold him in the light. Rocky, would you please tell Casey that we've held him in the light? Okay. 
Okay, friends, thank you for coming. And please come to Copper Dish.